uh, 6.30 on my computer, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Ken Johnson. I'm a horticulture educator with U of I Extension. Um, I am located in Jacksonville, uh, which is about 40 uh, miles west of Springfield um, in West Central Illinois, if you are not familiar with Jacksonville. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, everybody's favorite beetle, uh, the Japanese beetle. So we're going to talk about kind of how it got into the U.S., kind of the history of it in the U.S., um, the life cycle, and as well as talk about some of the ways we can manage um, this beetle in our landscapes. So where did it come from? As the name implies, uh, this beetle is from Japan. Um, and in Japan, it's actually considered to be a minor pest. Um, it is native to the kind of the main islands of the Japanese archipelago. Um, and there, uh, where it is found, this kind of unsuitable terrain uh, for it to really kind of build up large populations. Um, and there are natural enemies there. So there are uh, wasps and flies and stuff like that that will feed on it. And it's just kind of, those are going to keep those populations in check so you don't have those big explosions um, like we do here. It was first found in the United States in New Jersey, um, in Riverton, New Jersey, in 1916. And Riverton is that red uh, dot right here on the map of New Jersey. So that's where it was found. Uh, they actually think it came into the U.S. probably around sometime around 1911. Um, they think probably in the rhizomes of Japanese iris or the roots of azaleas. Um, and it just took some time for those populations to build up high enough for people to notice it. So similar to what we are experiencing with emerald ash borer now, uh, that was first found uh, in 2002 in the Detroit, Michigan area, but they actually think emerald ash borer showed up sometime in the early to mid-90s, and it just took a while for those populations to build up high enough for people to notice it. So kind of the same thing with Japanese beetle. It probably took five, six years for those populations to get high enough uh, for people to actually notice that uh, Japanese beetles are present. Uh, so here is a, a newspaper article uh, f from the Reading Eagle um, in Reading, Pennsylvania from July 23rd, 1926. Uh, and this just kind of goes through kind of the, the progression of Japanese beetles um, in the United States kind of in those early days after it was first discovered. Uh, so again, it was first found in 1916. Uh, they found about uh, a dozen beetles and, and a half square mile in Riverton, New Jersey. By 1918, uh, they had found Japanese beetles over a six and a half square mile area. By 1919, this had jumped to 48 square miles in New Jersey, and they are also starting to find them in Pennsylvania. By 1920, there was 11 square miles in Pennsylvania and 92 square miles in New Jersey, and they actually had uh, captured uh, 250 gallons worth of beetles um, kind of around that original detection point. So they went from a dozen beetles in 1916 to capturing 250 gallons worth um, in the River to New Jersey area over the course of four years. Uh, by 1922, uh, they were being found over 270 square miles. Uh, and then in 1926, uh, they were found over 700 square miles. Uh, and there were farmers from three counties in New Jersey and five counties in Pennsylvania that were reporting total crop losses because of the feeding by Japanese beetles. So in 10 years, we went from finding about a dozen beetles over a half square mile to finding beetles over 700 square miles and getting complete crop loss uh, due to their feeding. So you see we just had this uh, <clears throat> really big population explosion in a short period of time. So when did they first show up in Illinois? Uh, first time they were found in, in the Chicago area was 1932, and they were also found in St. Louis in 1936. Uh, and they are found off and on in other places uh, in, in Illinois. Uh, there were outbreaks in Highland Park, in Evanston, Forest View, Decatur, East St. Louis. Uh, but each of these were eradicated. And for the most part, uh, in Illinois, <clears throat> Japanese beetles were kind of relegated to urban areas until the late 1990s. Uh, then at some point in the 1990s, they're not really sure what happened, uh, but Japanese beetles started kind of leaving those urban areas and spreading throughout the state. So here on this map, you can see kind of the spread of Japanese beetles over time. So this map only goes to 1998, uh, but you can see here this initial finding um, and then just kind of that slow, steady march uh, across the U.S. So by 1998, it, it was found pretty much entirely throughout the state of Illinois. And these yellow spots were isolated uh, populations that were found elsewhere in the U.S. Now this is the, the most current map I could find uh, of Japanese beetle um, spread throughout the U.S. So you can see 
pretty much everywhere east of the Mississippi has Japanese beetles in it. Um, and on this map, they're now showing them in uh, North or South Dakota, Nebraska, um, Texas, Oklahoma. Um, I do know they have found them in Colorado. Um, listening to a webinar the other day, uh, they have them out there as well. So not the most up-to-date map, but you can see they're, they're kind of slowly making their way across the United States. So that's kind of, kind of a brief history of Japanese beetles uh, here in the U.S. Next, we'll talk about the life cycle. I mean, you can see on this picture here that uh, for the most part, Japanese beetles are going to spend most of their life underground. So they spend about nine months uh, out of the year underground. So uh, once those adults will lay their eggs, uh, kind of an August, the July, August time frame, and they will be underground again. They'll be underground until they start emerging in, in June or July, depending on where we are uh, in Illinois. So the adult emergence, uh, there's going to be one generation per year for Japanese beetles. Uh, and the emergence of the beetles is going to vary on latitude. So basically it's going to depend on where you are in the state. Um, it's going to kind of vary when these are going to come out. So typically in southern Illinois, they're going to be coming out mid, uh, mid to maybe late June. Uh, central Illinois, uh, kind of the late June time period is when we typically start to see them. And then northern Illinois, we usually start seeing them in early July. Now, the weather can affect this if we have an early spring and it warms up real quickly. We're going to see Japanese beetles emerging um, earlier than we would uh, in a year where we have a later spring um, like this year. So this year we may be, we may see them a little, little bit later than we have uh, in years past. It's a good chunk of the state. Um, spring or winter held on a little longer than it has been the last few years. So when they start to emerge, the males are going to be the, the ones that are going to be emerging first. Uh, they usually do this a couple days before the females do. Uh, they'll kind of hang out and feed, uh, kind of hang out and wait for the females to emerge. Once the females emerge, uh, the males will mate with them. Um, and a lot of times, especially you see this in golf courses where you have shorter grass where it's easier to see, you can see large balls uh, of Japanese beetles. Um, and inside of that ball, there's going to be a female, and all the rest of those are going to be males uh, trying to mate with her. And they'll call this balling. You just get these big balls of beetles uh, on the ground. Uh, and the adults are going to live for about four to six weeks. So once we start seeing them, they should be around for a month, a uh, month and a half. And then they'll, they'll start, populations will start declining as those adults start dying off. Uh, when it comes to egg laying, uh, after the females mate, they'll start to lay eggs. Um, they'll kind of burrow down into the ground, usually two to four inches deep, um, and they will start to lay eggs. Usually they'll lay around 20 eggs over a three-day period, uh, the first time they start laying eggs. After they're done laying eggs, they will then go uh, to a host plant and start feeding. Typically those are going to be plants that have other beetles already feeding on them. So the males usually have already started feeding on these plants, and the females will then go uh, and join them. And while they're feeding, um, they'll mate um, again. Um, and after they've fed for a while, they'll then go down back out, down into the soil again, burrow their way down two to four inches um, and lay an egg or two, go back, feed, and they'll just kind of do this back and forth, feeding <clears throat> and laying eggs. And they'll do this uh, around maybe 15, 16 times over their lifetime, and they'll lay about 40 to 60 eggs uh, per female over her lifespan. When they're laying eggs, they're going to be looking for areas that have moist soil, uh, it's kind of lots of sunlight, so full sun exposure. Um, and short grass cover. That's kind of the ideal area uh, for Japanese beetle or for Japanese beetles to lay eggs. So we think about um, a lot of our our turf, a lot of our lawns. This is kind of explaining a lot of our lawns. So you know we keep our grass relatively short. Uh, a lot of times it's going to be in full sun, and then especially if you irrigate your yard, you've got this kind of this perfect environment for Japanese beetles to lay their eggs in. So once those um, eggs are laid, the beetles will hatch out, the larvae will hatch out about uh, 10 to 14 days later, and they're going to start feeding on, typically going to feed on the roots of turf grass. They may also feed on some vegetable or ornamental leaves, but primarily they're going to feed on turf grass roots. Uh, they're going to go through three larval instars, so three larval stages. So insects have an exoskeleton, so in order for them to grow larger, they have to molt. They basically have to lose that the outside skin, that exoskeleton, in order to grow larger. So they'll go through three of these moltings, or three of these stages. They'll go through two moltings. So that first instar is going to last about two to three weeks. They'll stop feeding. They'll molt. Uh, there'll be a second instar uh, larvae or a grub. Um, that will last for about three to four weeks. 
Um, and then <clears throat> they'll molt again into a third um, in star larva. And this is typically going to be uh, usually around mid-September is when we start seeing those third instar uh, larva or grubs. And this is the stage that's going to overwinter. They're typically going to feed um, into October. Once our soil temperatures start getting down around 60 degrees, those uh, grubs are going to start migrating down, uh, down in the soil profile, go down deeper into the soil, uh, and start getting ready to overwinter uh, deeper in the soils. Uh, so as you know, as we're going through winter, they're kind of hanging out uh, in the soil. Once those soils start to warm up in the spring, so once they reach about 50 degrees, those larvae are going to start migrating their way uh, back up the soil profile and start feeding again. Uh, and I checked soil temperatures. Um, pretty much everywhere in the state, we've started hitting that 50 degree uh, soil temperature. Uh, there may be a few places in northern Illinois where we're not quite there or haven't been there very long. So for most of central and southern Illinois, Japanese beetles have started migrating up. Uh, northern Illinois, they've, they probably start or are going to be starting uh, relatively soon, start migrating up into the soil profile. Uh, they'll, start, they'll feed for another four to eight weeks, another month or two, um, at which point uh, they'll be fully grown, mature, uh, third instar larva. They'll then tunnel back down into the earth. They'll form an earthen cell. Uh, so they'll just kind of move around, kind of hollow out an area in the soil. So you, Kind of think of it like a cocoon um, for a moth. And then they will enter their pupil stage. And this is going to last for um, a week, maybe a little over two weeks. So basically, they're going to completely reform their bodies into the adults. Uh, that adult will emerge from that pupa. They'll hang around in the soil for a few more days. Uh, and then they will emerge uh, and start mating and eating um, and causing all, of our, all that damage to our ornamental plants that we're familiar with. So here's what those different life stages look like uh, in pictures. So we've got our egg right here. Again, that egg's going to hatch into our larva. So our first instar larva, our second instar larva, and our third instar larva, again, getting progressively bigger. Third instar is going to overwinter. Feed again in the spring. They'll pupate. And then the adults uh, will emerge starting uh, sometime in June in southern Illinois and usually in July in northern Illinois. So the adults. We're probably all familiar with the damage that the adults do. Uh, they feed on a wide variety of plants. So they've been documented to feed on over 300 different species of plants. Uh, they feed during the day. And they tend to prefer sunny areas. And they usually start off at the, on the upper leaves and kind of work their way down. So if you have a linden tree, you're probably familiar with this, or if you've seen linden trees um, in your travels, <clears throat> you can always kind of tell when the Japanese beetles are out because the top of the linden trees start looking kind of sparse. and you can kind of watch the progression of their feeding as they kind of slowly work their way uh, down those trees. The adults are going to be skeletonizers. So basically, when they're feeding on the plants, they're going to be feeding in between the leaf veins. They'll eat all, all that leaf tissue in between the veins, and they just leave behind uh, those veins. So you get kind of a lacy look uh, to those leaves. Fortunately, they show up a little bit later in the year. So typically, we do not see any dieback or death uh, on a healthy ornamental plants. Uh, these plants have produced most of the energy that they need for the year um, by the time Japanese beetles are showing up. So if they get defoliated, um, it's not really causing any damage. They've, they've produced the energy that they need. You may get a new flush of growth, but it's not harming the plant. Um, if you've got kind of a newly, <clears throat> newly planted plant or something that's, that's stressed or diseased, um, you know, this defoliation could cause some problems potentially, though. Um, and these are just some symptoms uh, of Japanese beetles. So if you grow roses, you're, you're probably well, very well familiar with this. Um, so blooms on roses, they are one of the plants they really like. Uh, so you can see you'll just kind of get these large masses of beetles feeding on that, uh, making those uh, blooms rather unsightly. Uh, linden, another one of their favorite plants. So you can see here, um, this is out <clears throat> full sun area. Start off at the top and then work their way down this linden tree. And again, this damage, this, this skeletonizing, this lacy uh, look to the leaves. So if you've got lindens, you're probably familiar with this look. Uh, they also really like a lot of our small fruits, so raspberry being one of those. Um, you know, if you grow raspberries and you have Japanese beetles around, you may be a little hard-pressed to actually pick any raspberries off those plants. Uh, and unfortunately, the larvae will also do damage. So 
both the adults and the larvae or the grubs will cause damage to our plants. And again, the larvae are feeding on roots, primarily turf roots or grass roots. Uh, they can also feed on vegetables and ornamental plants, though. And typically, when we start getting 10 to 12 grubs per square feet, we start seeing turf dieback. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see here all this dead grass. Basically, they've either eaten the roots and those plants can't take up water or nutrients, so they start dying. We can also get indirect damage from animals. So uh, if you have grub populations as low as three to five grubs per square foot, uh, you can have animals start moving in and digging up your, your lawn trying to eat those grubs. Uh, so stuff like um, raccoons, skunks, uh, some birds like starlings will come in and they can tear up your yard trying to find these grubs. So when it comes to managing uh, Japanese beetles, ideally we want to take an IPM or an integrated pest management approach. Um, and IPM is going to be a comprehensive approach to controlling, uh, in our case, insects, but any other pests, whether that be weeds or plant pathogens, uh, with environmentally and economically sound practices. So when we're doing IPM, we don't. our goal is not to completely eliminate the pest. If we do that, um, we're going to be probably doing some damage to the environment. We're going to be killing off, you know, in our case, trying to kill off all the Japanese beetles, we're going to be killing off beneficial insects more than likely. Um, and we don't really want to do that. So with using IPM, we want to keep our numbers, those Japanese beetle uh, populations low enough so that damage really isn't evident. You may have a few beetles here and there, but not enough to really cause a lot of damage that you're going to notice. Um, <clears throat> using IPM, we do use pesticides, but we want to try to use those only when we need to. Um, they don't wanna, we don't necessarily want to reach for that uh, container of pesticides first thing. We want to try to use some other things, and if populations get high enough um, where pesticide use is warranted, um, then we'll go ahead and use those pesticides. So when it comes to an IPM uh, program, uh, there's several different steps we're going to use. So the first thing is kind of know your enemy. We need to be able to identify our pest. Um, and once we can identify our pest, then we can then go out and monitor our plants and scout for it so we can tell when it's showing up and if it's causing enough damage um, where we need to take some, uh, some uh, control uh, strategy, do some control on them. Uh, there's a couple different management strategies we can use. Uh, we can use cultural control. Uh, so these are going to be practices that are going to reduce pest establishment, um, reduce their uh, reproduction potential, re uh, kind of reduce their, their dispersal and their survival in the environment. Uh, we have physical or mechanical uh, strategies we can use, so it could be directly killing the pest or, again, making the, the environment unsuitable for it. We have biological control, so we're going to be using natural enemies, whether those be predators, parasites, uh, pathogens, stuff like that. And then again, we have our chemicals or our pesticides that we can use to control them. Uh, so here on this side, um, these are some of our, <clears throat> our white grubs, the beetles that um, are white grubs as larvae. Uh, and some people will get uh, some of these different species confused with Japanese beetles. Um, so you can kind of you kind of guess which one um, is the Japanese beetle. So on the top there, uh, number four is actually going to be our Japanese beetle. And you can see there are several other uh, beetles are kind of the same size, same general shape as those, uh, as Japanese beetles. Uh, and then in the middle and on the bottom are white grubs. Number five is going to be our Japanese beetles. And again, you can see uh, there are several other species that have very similar sized uh, grubs to Japanese beetles, and they all are kind of the C-shaped white grub uh, in appearance. And all of these are going to be going to be feeding on, or we're going to be fighting these in turf uh, for the most part. So here is our picture of our Japanese beetle adults. And again, most of you are probably familiar with what they look like. Um, but if you're not, uh, the, the head and the thorax are going to be this kind of shiny metallic uh, green or emerald green color. Their, their elytra, or those hard wing covers, are going to be kind of a coppery appearance. And they're also going to be bordered, again, by this green color right in here. Uh, then on the abdomen, on that hind end, <clears throat> we're going to have uh, five tufts of white hair uh, on either side of the abdomen, and then each side is also going to have one large uh, tuft of hair. So we have two large tufts of hair uh, on the hind end of those beetles. So that's how you can differentiate those uh, for some of the other beetles we have out there. Here is what the grub looks like. Again, your, your 
typical white grub, C-shaped white grub uh, that we find in the soil. So to differentiate these, uh, you actually have to look kind of at the hind end um, at the raster pattern. So the raster is just a series of hairs um, on the hind end of those beetles. Uh, so you're going to need a hand lens or a magnifying glass, something like that, um, to look at these. And the Japanese beetles actually have a kind of a V-shaped raster pattern on them. That's how you're going to differentiate them uh, between, uh, from some of these other uh, white grubs we can find in our soils. And for the most part, it's not all that important, but there are a few um, of our chemicals that we're going to use, are like milky spores, only going to affect Japanese beetles. So if you want to be using that, you need to make sure you actually have Japanese beetles because that's not going to work on, some of, on our other white grubs that we find on the soil. So now that we know how to uh, properly identify our Japanese beetles, uh, we can now go out and monitor and scout um, for these. So when it comes to scouting for our grubs, uh, typically we want to sample for grubs um, in late spring, so April, June, uh, so this time frame. Um, and then again, do it again in late summer from August to October. <clears throat> uh, what we want to do if we have any dead patches of grass in our yard, um, well, we want to look near the edges of that brown dead area of the lawn, so kind of that interface between healthy um, and dead grass. Uh, one, to see if beetles are causing this, and if there's no beetles, then there's probably something else um, that's causing your grass to die. could be a, a, a disease or something like that. Um, if you don't have any dead patches, you can just go around and randomly sample around the yard. Uh, if you have some plants that get fed on real heavily by Japanese beetles, uh, you kind of want to, may want to kind of search around in that area because uh, the adults may not travel too terribly far to lay their eggs. Uh, so when you're scouting, you're going to dig or cut a hole that's 8 by 8 inches, uh, about 3 inches deep. You're then going to peel that grass back um, and look in the soil and in the roots of that turf for any grubs. Uh, record the number you found, multiply that by 2.25, and that's going to give you your grubs per square feet. And again, if we start getting around 10 grubs per square feet, uh, that's typically when you want to start treating because uh, you can start getting... Uh, plant damage that way. So kind of a picture is what we want to do. So we've got a dead spot in our yard right here. So we want to take a sample again, uh, kind of on the edge of that, that interface between healthy and, and dead grass. And then again, kind of look randomly throughout the yard uh, uh, for grubs. So basically over in this area where we don't have any damage, again, we kind of peel that turf back. And you can see we've only got a couple of grubs in there. So that's really not going to warrant any treatment uh, in that area. Over here, if Japanese beetles are causing that turf damage, um, you can see we have uh, quite a few grubs in there. So this you know, population this high would warrant treatment um, if you, if you want to go that route to control those Japanese beetles, uh, try to prevent them from killing more turf on you. Uh, when it comes to the adults, uh, again, remember they're going to be emerging um, mid to late June in southern Illinois, um, late June, early July or late June um, to July in central Illinois and kind of and, uh, early July in northern Illinois, again, depending on what the weather's been like. Um, and if you have any of the plants they really like, some stuff like grape, raspberries, roses, uh, linden, crab apples, some of those plants, that's typically the plants you're going to find them on first because those are the, some of their favorite plants. So if you have those, start checking those out. Uh, relative around when they are typically going to be start uh, to emerge. Uh, so when it comes to uh, control, when, we, when we're doing our cultural control with our larvae, uh, one way we can do this um, is to withhold irrigation in late uh, June into early August. So when those adults are out, uh, females are out laying eggs, uh, if we're, we withhold irrigation from our yard, um, this can help reduce our, our larvae population if we're not getting a lot of rain. Uh, Japanese beetle grubs need about 11 inches of water from July um, into the fall in order to kind of keep them uh, alive. So if we get into a situation where we're not getting enough rain um, and we start irrigating our lawns, a lot of times that's going to make up that difference um, in that 11 inches of water. So if you let your kind of turf go dormant, um, that's going to make that, that your yard that much less attractive to those beetles. So you're probably not going to get as much egg laying in there. Um, and if it gets really dry, you may have those eggs and larvae starting to die. 
Uh, when it comes to adults, some cultural controls we can do. We can grow unattractive plants. Um, believe it or not, there are some plants that Japanese beetles do not feed on. Um, and this uh, paper here, Relative Susceptibility of Woody Landscape Plants to Japanese Beetles, um, kind of goes through a variety of different uh, landscape plants that typically grow um, here in, in the kind of the Midwest um, kind of East Coast area of the United States. And I'll go through and talk about how susceptible they are to Japanese beetles. A lot of times you hear about companion planting and masking odors uh, to control Japanese beetles. Um, and all the studies I've, I have seen, uh, those don't work. Uh, actually, in a couple of them, in some cases, they actually can make it worse. Uh, so one that I found, they planted geraniums uh, in between rose bushes, and they actually had more beetles on those rose bushes than uh, the rose bushes that were planted with, with no geraniums. So in some cases, they can actually make your problem worse. No. So don't don't go the companion planting or masking odors route. It's not going to work for you. Uh, so here's a list of some of their favorite trees and shrubs. So again, if you grow any of these, you're probably well aware of this. Uh, so stuff like Japanese maple, Norway maple, roses, uh, crab apples, uh, some of our oaks, uh, lindens, uh, elms, hawthorns, London plane tree, uh, stuff like that. So if you're thinking about you know, adding some of these plants to your landscapes and you typically have a lot of problems with Japanese beetles, these may not be the best plants to plant. If you don't have a lot of problems, um, you know, just kind of buyer beware that you may, you may end up having uh, issues with Japanese beetles. Uh, there are some cultivars of some of these plants that are a little less attractive to Japanese beetles. Uh, so some linden cultivars like Sterling and Legend are a little less susceptible to Japanese beetle damage. Uh, and some of the crab apples, um, at least in Kentucky, they found uh, that varieties like David, Harvest Gold, uh, Jewelberry, and Red Jade um, have some resistance uh, to Japanese beetle uh, feeding damage. So those may be some plants you want to look at if you want to grow uh, some of those. So again, do a little homework and see if there are resistant varieties if you want to grow some of those plants. Um, when it comes to um, some of our herbaceous plants, uh, again, these are some of their, their favorite plants to feed on, so stuff like hollyhock, dahlia, uh, hibiscus, uh, sweet corn. If you grow that in your garden, they'll clip the silks, so you get some pretty, you can get poor pollination if you don't manage them um, in your garden. Uh, asparagus, rhubarb, grape, um, some of those other plants that they'll also feed on. So here's a list of some of the plants that, that are resistant. Um, so either they never feed on them or they don't really feed on them very much or just kind of occasional feeding. It's not, uh, you typically do not see real heavy damage on these or they don't feed on them at all. Uh, so stuff like red maple, uh, silver maple, boxwood, red buds. A lot of our, you know, some fairly popular plants on here uh, that they don't really feed on. Now, a lot of our needled plants, our needled evergreen stuff, they don't, you typically do not see any feeding damage on there. I don't want to say never because uh, there's always an exception to a rule, but for the most part, they are not going to feed on any of those. Uh, when it comes to kind of garden uh, crops and fruit, uh, some plants they don't tend to feed on too much, um, so, uh, pears, uh, common persimmon, gooseberry, and American cranberries. So if you want to try some fruit, uh, those are some plants you may want to look at if you have a lot of problems with Japanese beetles. Uh, and again, our herbaceous plants, uh, again, another a pretty good size list, and these are not all the plants, these are just some uh, that I picked out uh, that are, are resistant or they don't really feed on uh, very much. Uh, so columbine, begonia, lily of the valley, uh, foxglove, uh, poppies, nasturtium, uh, pansies, stuff like that. Uh, and just kind of a note, uh, diseased and poorly nourished trees and plants are more susceptible to attack, uh, not only to Japanese beetles, but just in general. Uh, you know, our stressed plants or plants that are growing poorly are going to be more susceptible to any um, insect or disease problems, not just Japanese beetles. Um, so, you know, make sure you, you know, if we have a drought situation, you need to water those plants. Um, you know, pro proper fertility, fertilize them if you need it, and if you need to do a soil set test, do that. Make sure you're putting those plants um, in the right area too. You know, if it's, you know, if they need full sun, don't plant them in shade, uh, stuff like that. 
And then our overripe or diseased or damaged fruit is also going to be very attractive. Uh, the smell of those, those fruit give off is very attractive to Japanese beetles. Uh, so that can draw those beetles into your fruit plantings. They will feed on that. Um, and then they can move on to your fruits that's still good. Uh, so you want to get that stuff out of your, out of your garden uh, so you're not drawing in those beetles to that area that will then feed on uh, your fruit that's still in good shape. Physical, uh, so some of the different physical control methods we can do. Uh, so if you've got a, a small garden or only have a couple plants that you're having problems with, you can go out and hand pick uh, the adults. Uh, so go out with your morning coffee, uh, get a bucket of water, put a few drops of soap in there, um, and then go out and pick off Japanese beetles off your plants. Uh, in the mornings, uh, they're fairly sluggish. They just kind of fall off the plants. If you can't try to do this during the middle of the day, they're a little more active and they're a little more liable to fly away, so it makes it a little bit harder to hand pick. Um, in the middle of the day, do it in the morning or in the evening, so they're a little more sluggish. If you don't want to touch the beetles, uh, you can just hold that bucket underneath and shake the plant. Again, if you're doing this in the early morning or in the evenings, they tend to just fall off uh, and they'll fall off into that water. Uh, again, you just need a few drops of soap. Um, you know, basically that soap is breaking the surface tension of that water so they'll sink. You don't have to make it real um, sudsy and stuff. If you have some high value plants, if you've got some rose bushes um, that you really like, um, or maybe some, uh, some fruit uh, that you don't want these beetles feeding on, you can cover them. Uh, just make sure, you know, the mesh that you're using, the holes are small enough that the beetles cannot fit through. Uh, the drawback to doing this, if you're putting this on fruit plants, stuff that needs to be pollinated, you're probably also excluding your pollinators, so you need to keep that in mind uh, as well. Uh, one thing you always see, you see these a lot, um, you know, whether it be big box stores, garden centers, nurseries, stuff like that, a lot of these, will, for them, will sell uh, these Japanese beetle traps. Um, and these traps have two different types of, of lures in them, uh, so they have a one that mimics the scent of virgin females, and this is going to attract males to those traps. Um, and they have a sweet-smelling food lure uh, that's going to attract both males and females. So that lure is typically somewhere up in this winged area. Beetles will fly in. Um, they'll bump into these into these wings. They'll then fall down into this green part. That is the trap on this where the where they collect them on this particular trap. Now, these traps can attract thousands of beetles a day. Uh, they're going to attract far more beetles than they can actually catch. Um, and as those beetles are being drawn into those traps, um, they may stop on a plant, decide they like this plant a lot, and they'll just stop there and feed. They won't make it to that trap. So as they're being drawn in, they may stop and feed on stuff. So typically, uh, we do not recommend uh, the use of Japanese beetle traps. If you really want to use them, uh, put them on the kind of the out around the perimeter of your, your property. Um, try to keep them as far away as possible from your desirable plants. I think in rural areas, uh, the recommendation is something like a quarter mile away uh, from desirable plants. In more urban settings, I think it's at least 40 feet away um, from desirable plants. Um, but just kind of show you why it's not a good idea to use these traps. Uh, so Aaron Hodgson over at Iowa State University, uh, they did kind of a little example of this. So they took this little uh, green trap off. Uh, they replaced that with a 13-gallon trash bag. They set this out um, and kind of let it fill overnight. And this is what they ended up with. So you can see uh, they pretty much completely filled that garbage bag. So that little trap on the bottom of the, the little green trap cup is not going to catch all these beetles. Now you can see here they're still crawling out. So this may be a little bit of an extreme situation. You may not have beetles this bad, um, but again, those traps more than likely are not going to catch all the beetles. Uh, and you're going to have to be constantly going out and emptying those traps. So you're better off just not using them. When it comes to our uh, biological control, there are several different um, critters out there that we can use to manage uh, populations of Japanese beetles. We have some bacteria, uh, stuff like milky spore disease, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis gallery, so BTG. You're probably familiar with some of the BTs for caterpillars and stuff. This is a different uh, a different type that's going to control uh, beetles. Uh, there are some nematodes out there that we can use. And there are some insects, some parasitoid wasp, and some flies. Um, I could not find any information on whether or not they are present in Illinois. Um, they are established uh, kind of in the northeast. Um, 
And again, I couldn't find anything on, on Illinois, but there are some um, insects out there that are at least controlling or doing some some work on controlling Japanese beetles um, out east. Uh, so milky spore uh, this is probably one of the more popular ways to control uh, or manage Japanese beetle populations. Uh, so this is caused uh, by a bacteria. Uh, so basically you're going to apply this to the soil and then water it in. <laughs> so it'll go down into the soil profile uh, so the, the, the grubs can feed on this. Once they ingest those spores, uh, those the spores are going to germinate. They'll infect the gut cells. It'll enter into the bloodstream, um, and then they will start reproducing in the insect's kind of bloodstream. So right here on the left, we have a healthy grub, and on the right, this is what a diseased one looks like, kind of that white milky appearance. Uh, that's how the disease gets its name. Um, so this can this particular uh, pathogen can build up in the soil over time. Um, and it can last in the soil for about 15 to 20 years. So, you know, in the past, it's provided some good long-term uh, control. It is not effective on annual white grub or mass chafer or any other type of, of grub. So this is where, you know, if you are scouting and you find these white grubs, you need to make sure you have actually have Japanese beetles if you're going to be using this because it's not going to work on the other types of white grubs. Now, there, they have, there have been some trials done um, the last few years with milky spore, and they're finding that it is not, um, as successful at managing populations as it has been in the past, and in some cases it re it's really not working at all. Um, so this may not be something um, that's working too well anymore. So um, you just kind of keep that in the back of your mind if you if you want to use this. It it may not work very well anymore. Another um, biological control we have again is our, our Bacillus thuringiensis gallery or BTG. Um, so some other BT formulations out there are BTK or Christakii. This is the one we use on caterpillars. Uh, there's uh, BTI or Israeliensis. This is what we use on mosquitoes, so our mosquito dunks. A lot of times we're going to have that one. So these, these BTs are, are fairly specific. Um, so BTG is only going to be working on um, beetle larvae or, or on beetles. Um, so this is another one that you typically are going to apply it to the soil and again water it in so it gets down into the soil so the grubs uh, can consume this. Now they'll, the grubs will eat this, um, this, uh, <coughs> uh, this pathogen. Um, it gets the proteins from this to get into so the, the grub, damages the gut and basically kind of lacerates the gut and they starve and eventually die. Um, and this is effective on a variety of different white grubs. So if you see white grubs, um, you don't necessarily need to identify what they are because it's going to work on all of them. And when we are using this, typically we're going to apply it uh, during uh, peak adult flight um, and egg hatch. So once we start seeing them, you want to put this down so when those, they're laying their eggs and those eggs start hatching, uh, they're consuming this uh, right away. I think there are some nematodes, uh, the heterohabitus. Um, is the species or the, the group that works the best on Japanese beetles. There are some Steinarema out there as well, but the heterohabitus uh, usually perform better against white grubs uh, than some of the other types of nematodes. Uh, again, these are living organisms, so you need to apply these as, as soon as possible after shipment. If you let them sit around for a while or they get too hot, uh, they will die. Uh, so when you apply these, uh, you, you want to get the grass wet first uh, and then irrigate these uh, nematodes into the soil, uh, kind of <clears throat> water that soil, uh, water that grass fairly well so those nematodes get down into the soil. They're not stuck on those grass blades because once that water dries out, those nematodes will die. Uh, and you do need to reapply these um, every year. You need grub control. Uh, so basically, they will <clears throat> they get into the, the larvae. Uh, they will release bacteria into the insect. Uh, that The bacteria will kind of multiply inside that grub um, and kill it and the, the nematodes will feed on it. So this is basically what that looks like. So we have some healthy um, grubs over here. This is what a diseased one looks like. So again, those nematodes make their way in, release those bacteria into the grub. The bacteria multiply, the nematodes feed on that, and then the nematodes um, emerge from that diseased grub, and they will then go and attack um, other grubs. Uh, and again, there are some insects uh, that are out there. So we have some parasitoid wasp uh, that will control Japanese beetles. Again, I haven't found anything about them being in Illinois, but they are 
uh, present um, in the East Coast. So if they aren't here, maybe they will eventually make their way here. Um, so for the wasp, uh, they will sting the Japanese who are going to be controlling Japanese beetle larvae. They'll sting the larvae, um, paralyze them. They will lay an egg on that grub. That wasp egg will hatch. The larvae will start to eat the, the Japanese beetle larvae uh, and kill it. Uh, there's also a fly. The fly is going to lay eggs on the thorax of the adult beetles. Now those fly eggs will hatch. The larvae will burrow in uh, to, the Jap to the Japanese beetle and kill it. And typically, they're going to be doing this before they can reproduce much. Uh, so here's the life cycle of those wasps. So here's the egg uh, right here that's been laid on the outside of that beetle or, or that grub. The egg is now hatched, and that larvae is feeding on it. Uh, here's that larvae right here. So that beetle is, is, is dead. Um, they'll spin a cocoon, and that will emerge the wasp, and it'll then go on. Uh, if it's a female, go on and lay other eggs and, and kill more grubs for you. Um, and here's the fly. So again, here are those eggs that they've laid. Those eggs will hatch. Those larvae will burrow in uh, to that beetle and, and eat it. So just a few notes on biological control. Uh, biological controls can be fairly expensive depending on the type you are getting. Um, and a lot of times it takes um, a decent amount of time for them to be effective. Those populations have to build up uh, in order for us to get um, some control, and a lot of times they may not build up high enough to really give us adequate control. A lot of that's going to depend on how high, in our case, how high Japanese beetle populations are. Uh, and they are living creatures, so you need the proper environment in order for them to be effective. So in the case of those nematodes, if you just kind of put them on the, on the soil and you don't really water them in well and they all get stuck on the grass blades, they're all going to dry out and die. You need to make sure you're, you're properly applying them in order uh, to give them a chance to work for you. All right, next up, we'll talk about uh, some of the chemicals that are out there that we can use to control Japanese beetles. Uh, and just some notes on chemical control. Uh, the label is the law. You need to make sure you're reading your chemical labels before you use them. Uh, you know, if you don't use them properly, you can get yourself uh, in trouble. Uh, read all the labels. You need to make sure you know that the crop or the plants that you are applying that chemical to are listed on the label. Um, and if you are applying them to food crops, you need to make note if there's any pre-harvest interval. Uh, so basically, if you apply some pesticides to a particular crop you're going to be eating, you may have to wait a certain number of days before you can harvest it. So you need to make sure uh, you're not violating that. So again, just read the labels. Um, they'll, they'll tell you how, how to apply it, how often you can apply it, um, all of that stuff. And if you ever need help reading labels, you can, you can stop by your local extension office and there should be somebody there that can help you do that. So when it comes to uh, controlling adults, um, there's a lot of different uh, insecticides that are labeled uh, for use against Japanese beetles. Uh, so our pyrethroids, uh, this is a large group of in insecticides. Uh, they, in general, are going to provide control for two to three weeks per application uh, for applying them to the foliage. Uh, Carbaryl, uh, typically going to be about one to two weeks of uh, protection. And then our botanical products are usually effective for about uh, three to four days. So you can see, depending on the product you're using, you may have to apply uh, them multiple times. You know, the kind of the advantage to some of our more persistent pesticides is you don't have to apply more often, uh, but you do run the risk of having some non-target effects of killing um, some non-target species. Uh, whereas our, our shorter-term stuff, like our botanicals, you, know, you have to apply them more often, but <clears throat> since they're not as persistent in the, the environment you may run a little bit less for risk of, of some non-target effects. Uh, insecticidal soaps and extracts, so plant extracts like garlic, uh, hot peppers, orange peel, stuff like that, uh, generally do not work all that well on Japanese beetles. Uh, those type of insecticides work a lot better on smaller uh, or soft-bodied insects. Um, not Don't typically do too well on Japanese beetles, so it's probably something uh, you, you want to avoid. Uh, when it comes to these chemicals, uh, you know, for the adults, we need to make sure we get good, thorough coverage on our plants that we're spraying. You know, if we leave out a good chunk of the plant, um, you know, those, in, those beetles won't be coming in contact with that pesticide and it's not going to kill them. So you need to make sure you have good coverage uh, when you're applying these. And you also want to avoid uh, spraying plants uh, that are blooming or have pollinators on them. Uh, again, labels on a lot of these pesticides uh, may say that uh, you cannot apply this to plants that are blooming or have pollinators present. Um, if you do have a product that 
you know, you can apply to plants that are in bloom. Uh, typically, you, you want to apply this stuff uh, early in the morning or, or in the evening uh, when pollinators aren't around, so, so you're not uh, potentially spraying them. So early in the morning, late in the evening, if you have uh, plants with flowers on them, if you can apply those pesticides uh, to those plants at all. Uh, there are some systemic products out there that we can use, so imidacloprid would be one of them. Uh, typically, uh, this is going to be applied as a soil drench, so you're applying this to the soil. The plants will then take this imidacloprid up, it will spread it throughout uh, the plant and protect it that way. Uh, you, do not, you, you don't want to apply these to lindens, and I think a lot of them actually specifically slade do not apply to linden, uh, because lindens are, are going to be blooming when our Japanese beetles are out, and if you apply imidacloprid to that, um, you run the risk of that the stuff getting into the nectar or the pollen um, and poisoning our pollinators. So you need to be careful with what uh, what plants you put the systemic product on. Uh, and and just a note, you know, if you try to con uh, control your adult Japanese beetles by controlling grubs, um, it's not going to work. Again, the adults can fly, so you can kill off all the grubs in your yard. Uh, the adults are just going to fly in from other areas. So. Don't think that you know by killing all the grubs in your yard, you're going to be controlling your adults. It doesn't. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So when it comes to uh, the grubs, I uh, really only want to start treating if we have damage evident or we've reached that threshold of 10 grubs per square feet. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so we're going to apply um, usually as a spray or as a granule. Usually you want to do this, uh, apply that stuff to a small area, um, water it in with about a half inch of water again to get that down into the root zone, into the soil, uh, so those grubs are coming into contact with it. And then go and treat another small area and just do a small area at a time to make sure you can get all that pesticide down into the soil uh, where those grubs are going to come into contact with it. If you're going to be using a metacloprid to control the grubs, uh, you apply that mid-July. Um, if you have an adult beetle flight that was real high, uh, in that area, or if it's an area that you typically have trouble um, with, with Japanese beetle grubs or other white grubs. And our grub damage is, we typically see that starting in August and September. Again, it's usually a little bit drier time of the year. The, the larvae are getting bigger, so they're eating more. Um, but that's typically when we're going to see, see our problems. This time of the year in the spring, um, this is when our, for most of us, we're going to have cool season grasses, so this is the time of year where our grasses are growing quite a bit. So a lot of times we don't see too much grub damage because the plants are growing fairly quickly, so they can kind of replace that dam those damaged roots uh, relatively quickly. So typically we're not going to be doing much, uh, much we're not going to be doing uh, kind of control for, for Japanese beetle grubs in the spring. We do that um, in the summer. Um, so one question uh, we get a lot um, is, you know, will cold temperatures during the winter affect uh, Japanese beetles? And I don't really have a good answer for you. Um, maybe it depends. A lot of it's, it's going to depend on, on the type of winter that we have as to whether or not, you know, it's going to kill off a good chunk of our Japanese beetles. Uh, so some of the reasons why, you know, our cold, or if we have cold winter, why it may not kill our Japanese beetles. Uh, Japanese beetles are susceptible to freezing. Uh, but their super cooling point, so basically the point at which they start to freeze, uh, is 19 degrees. So they uh, create chemicals in, in kind of in their blood, uh, antifreeze chemicals that basically lowers their freezing point. So they can get down to 19 degrees uh, before they freeze. And generally they're going to overwinter two to six inches below the soil surface. Uh, so the soil is a real good insulator, so the soil is, isn't going to get as cold as our air temperature. So we could have 10 below air temperature, but the soil uh, temperature could still be, you know, upper 20s, 30s degrees still. Uh, and then if we have any snow cover on top of that, that's going to insulate that soil even more. Um, and these these Japanese beetle grubs are capable of going 8 to 10 inches deep uh, in the soil, so they can kind of keep moving down that soil if it if it gets too cold for them. So those are so those are some of the reasons why um, you know our cold winters may not kill them. Uh, some reasons why they they may die because of a cold winter. Uh, again, they're not going to go uh, much deeper than 11 inches during the winter. Uh, and if we do get a situation where the ground freezes, you know, 12, 14, 15 inches deep, and it stays frozen for three weeks, uh, we will start to see grubs die um, after that time. So if we get long periods of deep freeze um, 
we can see um, populations reduced by about two thirds. Um, unfortunately, other white grubs are kind of our native white grubs can tunnel even deeper, um, and they can survive colder temperatures. So we're not necessarily going to be seeing them killed off, and they may move into areas where the Japanese beetle grubs were, um, but we may see uh, fewer Japanese beetles. Uh, so for this year, you know, winter of 2017-2018, uh, at least in in Jacksonville, uh, we never really got terribly cold temperatures, so I don't think we probably didn't get cold enough to have any effect on the grubs, so I don't think our winter is going to do much to, uh, to affect our populations anyway. Um, so here um, is my contact info, um, so if you guys have any questions um, in the future you need to get a hold of me, uh, here is that. Uh, feel free to give me a call, send me an email, um, I'll do my best to help you. Um, and then uh, this presentation and in any all of our past uh, Four Seasons Gardening series uh, are recorded and they are put up on YouTube. Uh, so if you ever want to if you ever want to watch this one again or uh, watch some of our other Four Season programs, uh, you can go to this uh, YouTube page, uh, go.illinois.edu/four-seasons-recordings, um, and you can access all of those recordings there. So with that, uh, we will do some questions. Um, so 8x8 eight eight seems like a big hole to take out of the turf. Does it need to be that big? Um, any alternatives? Uh, you can do it smaller. Um, you know, you're going to have to, your multiplication is going to be a little bit different. Uh, but basically, you're just kind of peeling that turf back. So I mean, if you replace it, you're not really doing too much damage. Uh, you just kind of cut that, cut that area, peel it back, um, replace it, kind of uh, stomp it down, and it should be fine. Uh, with the BTG, uh, how does this affect the other feeders, uh, like worms who eat the grubs? Uh, so the BTG is only going to be affecting the grubs, so you shouldn't have you know stuff like worms and stuff uh, being affected. It's specific to uh, beetles. Uh, where is is there a growing degree day rule of thumb uh, on applying imidacloprid? Um, I am not aware of one. Typically. You know, by early May, we want to put that down, mainly because it takes it could take some time for those plants to take that chemical up um, and get it throughout the plant. So that's why I usually want to do it by early May. So if you want to put it down this year, um, you know, do it sooner rather than later. Because um, if you put it, if you wait too long, you know, the plant just can't move it around enough in order to give you real good uh, protection. So any other questions out there? You're welcome. Doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, if you think of any, um, again, you've got my contact info. Feel free to send me an email, give me a call if you think of anything later. Um, that I think we'll finish up. So thanks for uh, joining us tonight, um, and enjoy the rest of your night.